Welcome in. It is Big Ten Today. We're presented by Gatorade on this Friday. Dave Revson, Andy Katz, Mike DeCourcy is going to join us in a moment to another action-packed day. Three games in the Big Ten last night. And what I'm not wearing right now that I should have is the headband. The boo-booey headband. Yes. Chris Collins made an appearance with the boo-booey headband in the postgame last Everyone night. Everyone in the locker room was wearing it. Boo-booey. All-time leading scorer at Northwestern. Big-time winner. Yeah, pretty amazing to think that Boo Booey and Taylor Battle, yes. two brothers. Yes. You got 14 teams in this league, and you have two brothers who are the leading scorers. In, in different schools. Yeah, different amazing. schools. Amazing, it, amazing. It, it really is pretty remarkable. It was uh, quite a night at Welsh Ryan last night. It's been quite a morning for Mike DeCourcy, immersed in the brackets. He's got seed lines and quad one wins floating through his head, but he always makes time for us. Hello, Mike. Hello, Dave. How are we doing this morning? You good? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll tell you what, the, the adventure I had last night to be here and to present a bracket, it could be a show in itself, but I am delighted to be here. Uh, I think that it's it, what we saw last night in the Big Ten was, again, reflective of some really promising teams for March, uh, with Purdue having the great night that they had and making a very loud statement that what you saw Sunday, you don't have to pay attention to. Can you give us a very quick Cliff Notes version on what you're talking about last night? Like, you, you, can't, just, you can't just leave it out there. Oh, okay. I will tell you. I drove last night to Bloomington, Indiana to see the great Caitlin Clark. Ah. And as I pulled off 69 South uh, onto the exit to Bloomington, my car started to rattle. Uh -oh. And it was pretty apparent that there was lots of bad stuff going on. <laughs> with it so i pulled up to outside assembly hall and thought about going in and then i called my wife and i said maybe i should come home because i wasn't sure that the car was going to make it and uh as it turned out once i got on 69 north it was having none of it so i had to pull off and waited two hours for a tow truck oh, and was man. towed all the way back home uh so here i am uh delighted to be here as i said uh, maybe a little bit uh Tow money poorer, but uh, we're here. All right. Well, we're glad you made it I never through. got to see Caitlin, though. You, if not your car. Yeah, well, it wasn't, wow. it wasn't Caitlin Clark's best yeah. night, but Indiana had a lot to do with that. All right, let's get to our big story. It involves last night's results in the Big Ten, aside from the demise of Mike DeCourcy's car. Purdue bouncing back <laughs> in a big way from its loss to Ohio State. How about 96 points against one of the nation's top defenses, Zach Eady, 25, Cam Heidi, career-high 18. Minnesota continues to surge. Elijah Hawkins, career-high 24. The Gophers win for the fifth time in seven games. And as we talked about, Boo Booey, now the all-time leading scorer at Northwestern. Cats have won four or five as they top Michigan. Mike, let's start with Purdue. And I think Rutgers was kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time. I mean, this is just, we were talking about this yesterday, it's kind of the bad timing award when you get Purdue in this situation. But, I mean, Rutgers is a truly elite defensive team. They are outstanding. Number two in the nation in defensive efficiency. And Purdue just dissected them last night. What a performance. That's, that's the thing. It, it, you, you beat a team that's in the middle to lower third of the conference, and that could happen anywhere in the country, and people might say, well, whatever. But this is a team that is number two in the nation in defensive efficiency. And Purdue didn't just beat them. They could have gone to 100. And you saw what, what you saw with Zach Eady being dominant again. You saw Lance Jones deliver another tremendous performance. Cam Heidi come off the bench and say, hey, I'll take whatever minutes you'll give me, and I'll do something good with them. Those were all great signs for the Boilers. But I think it was, in general, just the statement that uh, they hadn't been fully themselves on the weekend, but if you really engage them, they are capable of beating anybody and beating anybody uh, significantly. Well, the other thing we have to point out, and we've seen this before from Rutgers, when Mawat Mag does not play, yeah. it changes them entirely. We saw what happened at the end of last season. He didn't play. They found out during the day because he had lower leg soreness. So you take him out. And there was no question that Rutgers was going to be a different team. Yeah, and, and we saw that. And I, I, it is fair to point out because we saw this last year yes. as they declined. But, you know, earlier, I think it was like a week ago, they played Northwestern without Mawat Mag and, and had a really nice defensive effort. Where was the game? At Rutgers, no doubt. I, I, I hear you. I, I, again, I, I just I want to give a ton of credit to Purdue. Yes. I mean, you go 1.5 points per possession against Rutgers. That says something. I think you look at... 
know, Mike mentioned Cam Heidi, who was fantastic, and if he gives him another option off the bench, incredibly talented and long and athletic and a really, really good player. And then the other thing is you've got Zach Eady, who draws the most fouls of any player in America, and he's hit 19 straight free throws now. I mean, it, it's it's something else. It's over. I mean, he's going to be back-to-back right. National Player of the Year. Only a handful of people in the history of the game have done that. All right, let's get to Michigan and Northwestern. And this was a close game. In fact, Michigan was leading for most of the first half, and then Northwestern pulled away in the second half. But really, this night was a celebration of Boo Booey. Well, I got there in time to see the end uh, and talk to Boo after the game. And what I loved, Mike didn't see Caitlin Clark, but Boo referenced that he wanted to break the record with a Caitlin Clark like <laughs> three. The fact that that has become yeah. like, you know, a Steph three. And right. now it's a K- and it wasn't as far back as Caitlin. It was close though. It was I a know. bomb. Yeah. So I mean that was significant. Got it out of the way early, similar to what Caitlin Clark did, you know, when she broke her record. Um, but then Brooks Barnheiser was saying after the game, it took them a little bit while for him and Ryan Langbord to say, wait a minute. Like, we can't afford to play like this. We need to ratchet up. And they hit that second gear, as you saw in the second half. And that's the difference with this team, even without Ty Berry. Um, they got good minutes from Blake Smith. I mean, you know, toward the end of the, the game. And um, this team is resilient. We have seen this time and time again. They know that was a game they could not afford to lose. They don't have a margin for error. So they took care of business in the second half. Now they have a week off before they go to Maryland. They've got the road game at Michigan State. they got the home Iowa. Who knows? They could be surging by them, desperate. And then they end with another boo-booey senior night with Minnesota. Yeah, it's not as easy a schedule, I think, as people thought it was, like when they made the turn. I mean, those those are all tough games, no question about it. I think one thing that's been really interesting, Mike, is... They have changed the way that they play with Ty Berry out, bringing in Nick Martinelli. Offensive rebounding has suddenly become part of their game. They were 13th in the Big Ten in offensive rebound percentage in conference games with Ty Berry. They're fourth without him. Obviously, they'd love to have Berry. They're not as good an offensive team, certainly not as good a shooting team. But the way they have changed on the fly, I think, is a testament to what a good team this is and a connected team and and what a good coach and coaching staff they have in Evanston. Yeah, and also a testament to the versatility of Nick Martinelli, what he's become in the offense. It's a massive change for him in terms of responsibility and role, and he has managed it really nicely. It's not been a seamless transition, but to go to uh, being essentially a starting wing now uh, instead of a versatile sub, uh, he's, he's really made a huge difference in, in this sequence su- uh, subsequent to Ty Berry's injury. And also what, what we saw from Ryan Langbord and what we've seen over the last several games. Uh, obviously the Rutgers game being an exception because he wasn't there uh, for most of it. Uh, but the last couple of games, he's understood what he's had to do with Ty not there. He's got to make shots. He's got to be dangerous from the perimeter because Ty was such an excellent shooter and that offense needs space in order to work. Uh, and, and so when you saw what a difference he could make and the, and the Michigan uh, defense had to adjust to that, you saw more of the ordinary, and, and I should say the extraordinary Brooks Barnheiser. The Bo- Brooks Barnheiser that has been in place for most of this year uh, was not there in the first couple of games without Ty Berry because the space wasn't there. And now that Langborg is a legitimate threat that everybody has to honor, I have him as 12 of 22 over the last four games. Uh, from three point uh, that's that that gives uh, Brooks so much more ability to be the player that he is uh, I, I just want to say one quick thing about Michigan um, you know there's always this chatter about next year where you're not gonna have all 18 in it's gonna be 15 to the 18 this is an example this team they haven't quit but they're running out the string and there's no need for a team that's at the bottom that's really struggling personnel wise to have a full roster to then continue on to the conference tournament. You know, if this team had finished 18th next year, they'd be done. So you see an example where it's not the end of the world if you're at the bottom of a league, 16, 17, 18, to not play in the conference tournament. 
Understood. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally get where you're coming from here. This is not a team that has any chance of playing in the postseason. And if you have several teams like that at the bottom of your league, then then the point is well taken. I, I do think like there are some teams who would say, hey, you know, we're 16th, but we still think we we've got a shot. So but this is the this is the trade off. And this was the way well, you gotta do it for the men and the women. Absolutely. This was, no, this was the way to make it work. A whole long week It was the way to make it work. Absolutely. Uh, Minnesota, man, they are clicking offensively. Mike, this is really a fun team right now and one that you look at, right? No one wants to play Minnesota. And this was an impressive display. They continue, I think, to just get better and better. And they have the look. I understand they don't have the resume yet, but they have the look of an NCAA tournament team. Yeah, I, I was reminded as I was preparing for the show, where is the conference tournament going to be? Oh, yeah, <laughs> Minnesota. How about that? Uh, what, a, what a challenge that'll be for some of their opponents in the conference tournament. Uh, no doubt with the way they're playing, they will have a significant response from the Minneapolis and St. Paul community, from the university community. They could have great crowds, great support. And right now, they with, with what they have on the floor, uh, about all you need to add to it is that support off the floor uh, in a neutral in what should be a neutral court environment. Uh, Pharrell Payne playing phenomenally and, and such a handful that he's challenging some of the best big guys in this league. Uh, you see Elijah Hawkins now now consistently making three pointers along with being the literal best passer in college basketball. Uh, and of course, Cam Christie's coming along. And what I loved about last night was Dawson Garcia scoring in the 20s while making only one three. Do I have a problem with him taking threes? No, he's certainly a very capable three-point shooter, but I don't want him to be only a three-point shooter. I want him to be willing to go in and do some uh, of the uh, of the rougher work, and he certainly showed his, the capacity and the willingness to do that last night. All of that adds up to the most dangerous team in terms of what they need to accomplish and what they can accomplish over the last several weeks. Here's what they got left at Nebraska, at Illinois, home Penn State, home Indiana, at Northwestern. Hard schedule, but what if they win three of five? Right. Four of five. At Nebraska and at Illinois, if you can get one of those games, and we'll talk about a little bit with Mike, we're going to do bracketology, but you've got to be in the conversation. In, in my, they go, I understand they only have one quad one win. I know. What if they go four and one? Well, yeah. I mean, if they go four and one, well, we're going to talk about this. Right. It's a beautiful segue All right. to what's coming up next. Because Mike DeCourcy's latest bracket, hot off the presses this morning. Still six Big Ten teams in the dance as of now. Purdue's a one seed. Illinois holds steady as a four. Wisconsin's still a five. Michigan State's lost to Iowa. Dropped them a spot. They're now an eight. Northwestern and Nebraska stay the same from Tuesday's bracket at nine and ten. And look who is in the first four out now, the Iowa Hawkeyes. Uh, Mike, let's break this down a little bit. And let's start with Purdue. There have been a lot of talk after the Ohio State game. There are people moving them out of the number one overall seed. Then UConn goes out and gets blasted by Creighton. So where does it stand between those two? Who do you have as the number one overall seed right now? I'm back to Purdue as the one overall in, in large part because their resume, in the, the difference between their resumes is significant. I mean, UConn's fabulous, and they're going to be uh, one of the one seeds. There's no doubt in my mind. They're going to start in Brooklyn and go to Boston uh, if they continue to win, of course. Uh, they, they are, they're fantastic. But they, their resume does not stand up to Purdue's at this point. Uh, they, before the loss to Creighton, uh, they could say, well, they only had a couple of defeats, and uh, and now uh, Purdue had a bad loss on their resume, uh, but getting beaten badly by Creighton. And then it goes back to me for, for when you look at the br committee's bracket reveal a week ago, uh, Purdue had beaten five, excuse me, six of the other 15 teams that were in the four seed lines. And UConn had beaten two. Hmm. And UConn, like I said, has a number one seed resume, but it's not to Purdue's degree. So Without a doubt, to me, that, that's the one overall, unless something happens down the, down the, uh, the stretch. Uh, I think, honestly, I think that Purdue can lock up a one seed at some level, one of the first four seeds, uh, just by winning two more games. I don't think they need to do more than that uh, because no other teams out there like Arizona losing on Thursday night to Washington State. 
uh, other teams out there aren't going to be able to position themselves to challenge Purdue if they can just get a couple more W's. Both of those teams with nine quad one wins, but I think to your point, not all quad one wins are made the same, and, and that speaks to the strength of Purdue's resume. Illinois took a, a bit of a hit on the court. I mean, falling to Penn State this week. Again, that's a quad two game. It's not a game that kills your resume in any way. We saw what a good environment that was in State College. Interesting to me, though, they didn't drop at all. So give us a sense of how Illinois was able to hold steady. Some of that is the absence of strength uh, on the five line. Uh, the, five, the, the five seeds uh, are not as powerful. That, that You're looking at uh, uh, teams like Kentucky that lost on the road to LSU. So sort of evening out. They had been the five uh, at that point and, and maybe were in position to climb up because of the Illinois loss, but couldn't hold on at the end and lose to LSU. So elements like that, uh, that were significant to Illinois staying on that line. What's interesting is that Illinois schedule down the stretch doesn't include anybody that doesn't have a chance at this thing or basically is, has wrapped up a spot like Purdue. So there are lots of opportunities for Illinois to climb higher and some obviously opportunities for them to, to struggle to hold where they are. Uh, two Iowas, Minnesota, at Wisconsin, and Purdue, that's a lot of challenging teams. Every one of those teams is in the hunt or, like I said, in, in my field now. So it, it, I think that Illinois has a lot of opportunity to dictate where they're going to end up. Yeah, two home games this week, the first of those Iowa games and then Minnesota as well. Uh, Wisconsin righted the ship a bit. They topped Maryland at home. I think their resume is really interesting. I mean, they have seven quad one wins. There are only three teams in the country that have more. UConn and Purdue, who we talked about, and Houston as well. And then you look at, they have only played six games against teams that are outside of quad one and two, which speaks to the, the great schedule strength. Is that what has kept them here on the five line, despite the fact it's been a little uneven here in the last few weeks? Yeah, if you look at the other five seeds, uh, not the, the other teams on the five line, they each have four quad, four quad one wins. And as you mentioned, the Badgers have seven. So significant difference there in that sense. And you, met, you, you cited the, the strength of their schedule overall and how they've performed reasonably well against that. And I, I think that gives Wisconsin the opportunity to climb that a lot of others in this neighborhood, the four, five, six line, uh, are going to struggle to find. It, with, with what Wisconsin has already achieved, uh, they've got a great base. So any achievement they add to that down the stretch, whether it's on their schedule or in the conference tournament, could lift them a couple of lines. But they've got to continue to play as they did in the Maryland game. Uh, we've seen them uh, struggle recently, in, not, not necessarily to play, but just to finish games, to stay ahead. They haven't performed badly in most of those games. But they've got, to, they've got to get W's if they're going to hold where they are or climb on the board, which I think they do have a great chance to do. Team that, of course, has played in 22 of the last 24 NCAA attorneys did miss it last year. Michigan State has the longest active streak in the Big Ten, 25 in a row for the Spartans. I know they're still solidly in right now, did have the home loss to Iowa, but still in really good position here, Mike. Yeah, I think Michigan State just has to be Michigan State down the stretch, which means they'll probably win uh, two out of every three or three out of every four and maybe disappoint you a little bit. Uh, they'll get in. But I think what they're shaping up right now as is a perfect 8-9 team, uh, a team whose, whose overall accomplishments don't dictate any higher, uh, but who, that has to be in based on what they've achieved. And that if you think about it, uh, they'll give a, whoever the uh, opposite in the 8-9 is a great game. And if they win that, they'll give the number one seed a challenge, but probably won't beat them. Uh, so it's, as we saw a year ago, Illinois, I could, I mean, you could see it. It was like a telegraphed pitch that Il Illinois is going to be an, an eight, nine type game, uh, that that's where they were going to wind up in the bracket. It was so obvious. And right now, Michigan State has the chance to, to rearrange the narrative on their season, but they've had that chance really for the last month and have never really quite seized that opportunity. It's never too late until it's too late, but right now I see them headed uh, directly toward an 8-9 game. Right, and then you're a one seed who gets a preseason top five team where they to win that 8-9 game, which uh, you can imagine whoever the coach is in that matchup might be griping just a little bit. What about Northwestern? Their resume is strange. They are 9-7 and seven against the top two quads, which is really fabulous. 
they have that loss hanging over them against Chicago State, which is somewhat less than fabulous. But the thing that stands out is how much the net absolutely hates them. I mean, it's crazy to me. I guess that's margin of victory. I mean, is that what that's about? It can't be that one game that holds them down that much, is it? Like, what's going on with their net ranking? Yeah, that dings them, the, the Chicago State game. That certainly has an impact. But right. it's really more about uh, margin of victory. The, the, the net is a predictive metric. Uh, I know that, that they didn't originally, when they designed it, say that's what it is. But that's how it's performed. If you, if you go over time, over the last few years, and you say, okay, what it, at the end of the year, where did Ken Palm have these teams? And, like, compare the top 20 between the net and Ken Palm. And they were close to identical. They weren't exactly identical, but they were close enough uh, that, they're, that you can tell that that's what it is. I, I've never been a fan of having a predictive metric at the heart of the selection process. There are results metrics like Kevin Palga's KPI, uh, ESPN strength of schedule, that I think something like that should be at the core. It doesn't have to be those two, but something like that should be at the core of the selection process. That should be the defining marker uh, and then Northwestern wouldn't look like that on the on the uh, the tally the the that the, the NCAA puts out every day. They wouldn't have as difficult a ranking. But it they the committee is supposed to pay greater attention to the record metrics uh, than they do to predictive metrics when they make selections. That's supposed to be the core of it. And in conversations with different people who are involved in the process. That's pretty much how they view it. Now, you can't get into the mind of every committee member and know that for sure, but that's the general theme, that you get in on your record metrics and you get seated on your predictive metrics. That's what they're kind of trying to accomplish. So I think the, I think the Wildcats are fine as it is, 19 and 8, great records, some terrific wins. I think they're in really good shape in that regard, uh, but they can't hurt themselves down the stretch, and every game now is an effort because they're thin. Let's get into Nebraska, the huge road win for them at Indiana. Not huge in that Indiana is a great team by any stretch, but huge in that they hadn't won a conference road game. And to just show that you can do that, I think, allays any concerns that the selection committee might have that, well, this is just a team that is uh, a creation of its home court advantage. What did that Nebraska win mean to you? Yeah, that's exactly what it meant. It, it really dressed up that that road record one is a lot different than two uh it just looks so much better and it's not exactly where they want to be but they still have a a road game or two down the stretch that they that that are winnable uh they, they, their entire stretch run is winnable that's the thing that nebraska looks at right now there's not much opportunity for them to uh to achieve uh, the results that would improve their quad metrics that sort of thing uh, they are what they are in terms of quad one uh, it's not going to change. They don't have any quad one games left. So what they have to do now is to continue to perform like they did against IU and get the results down the stretch that will secure themselves in the field. Uh, I think they could afford three and one, but obviously you'd feel much better given the nature of the opposition. Uh, only Minnesota is really in the hunt at this point. And, that, that, and, uh, and that's, a, that's a game it's not a true bubble game yet because Minnesota still has to play its way to the bubble, but it's kind of like that uh, where you're, you're trying to win for yourself, but you're also trying to do a little damage to the competition. You could really hurt Minnesota's charge, which uh, it, Minnesota's charge might help the entire league, but as you're sitting there somewhat close to the bubble, yeah. it doesn't help you. No, no, for sure. And remember, they lost a 17-point lead to the Gophers in Minneapolis earlier this year, so you don't want to get swept by them either. So you touched on Minnesota a little bit. Let, let's talk about Iowa because they're the ones now on the move into your first four out. Give us a summation of kind of where they are and what they would need to do. Yeah, they, they've got Illinois twice, home and road, uh, ends, uh, ends on the road. Uh, excuse me, ends at home. They, they're at Illinois first, and then they go to Illinois at the end, and they also have an at Northwestern. So opportunities there for quad one victories. That's three quad one opportunities for them. Uh, they, if they continue to play as they have, they're going to be in those games. They've, they've played really well on offense and have been much more competitive defensively in their last few games. So I think they have a chance. And we talked about Minnesota, uh, not on the bubble yet. I think it's unfair to say that, but great opportunity to climb there. And again, that, 
that Minnesota site for the Big Ten tournament could not be better times for the Gophers. Right. I do think we tend to forget about that every year, and it's around this time each time that we talk about the tournament, I say, we know who they're playing the rest of the regular season, but you can get in based on what you do in the conference tourney, and certainly Minnesota with a better opportunity than anyone given the quasi-home court advantage. The Mary Nutter Collegiate Softball Classic began yesterday just outside of Palm Springs. Five Big Ten teams are competing, along with two future Big Ten teams in Oregon and UCLA. Wisconsin started with a split. They beat Oregon State and lost to 11th-ranked Mizzou. Rutgers won their first two games. They beat Hawaii and UC Riverside. Northwestern and Nebraska play today. Illinois will play tomorrow. Michaela Chester joins us now. She is covering this event out in the desert. Michaela, welcome. Give people who aren't familiar with the Mary Nutter just a bit of an overview as to kind of what it is and where the Big Ten teams and, and the future Big Ten teams fit in. Yeah, this is just a prestigious event in NCAA softball. It's really as good as it gets, a cornerstone event every single year. Here. It's actually celebrating its 20th anniversary this year, but it's just a tournament that showcases the biggest stars in NCAA softball, some of the top ranked teams in the country. It's a beautiful setting. I've got mountains behind me. You might be able to see it yeah. um, right behind me, but the competition's as good as it gets. And the Big Ten teams here are going to be facing off against the top arms and teams in the country. Well, let's run through a few of those Big Ten teams. As I mentioned, some of them played yesterday, including Rutgers, which had a nice year last year this feels like an up-and-coming program the prognosticators see them as a solid middle of the pack big 10 team this year what did you learn about rutgers yesterday yeah rutgers showed some grit they overcame a pretty big 6-1 deficit in the first game to beat hawaii what ended up being a high scoring game 14 to 7 and then they got another win over uc riverside so they're looking good it's hard to tell early in the season but katie winger is a player to watch there. She just had her seventh home run of the season, and that leads the Big Ten. She's getting closer to breaking Rutgers' all-time home run record, too. So watch out for her and that offensive lineup. The question marks are always in the circle, which seems to be the biggest thing for all Big Ten teams. But um, they're looking good and got two wins yesterday. Uh, team that won 30 games last year, most since 1994. So a couple nice wins there. Let's talk about Wisconsin. I mean, their schedule's been brutal here early on. They had a rough weekend. Brutal last weekend but I mean they gave a lot of ranked teams very good games and kind of similar story yesterday they got the win and then gave Missouri all they can handle a nationally ranked team so how much do you read into kind of the record versus how competitive they've been here early on even in defeat yeah you've got to read a lot into how competitive this Badgers team has been I mean they lost five in a row like you mentioned at the Clearwater Invitational, but just a gauntlet of a schedule. And you got to think they're pushing all these top ranked teams that when it comes to Big Ten conference play, they're going to be looking really good, having seen some of the best arms in the country. They finally came out on the right side of one yesterday with a 3 2 win over Oregon State. So that was really good to see, but then lost another heartbreaker by one run and ended up. Uh, I think they ended up scoring Missouri, the winning run in the top of the seventh on a wild pitch. So just a heartbreaker. But this team is is showing really good signs. Um, you know, you think you lose a player like Kayla Conwit and they might not be the same team, but they are pushing these top teams, giving them all they can handle. So I think you don't have to read into this this uh, record too much because they're look they're looking really good against top teams. Have really shown some power here early on this year. Let's talk about some of the teams that haven't played yet. Northwestern and Nebraska are considered to be among the class of the Big Ten. We know Nebraska has had a devastating injury already, and you can get into that a little bit just to, to fill people in on, on what all that means. Illinois hasn't played yet, traditionally pretty solid program. What are you expecting from each of those three as they take to the diamond here? Yeah, I'll start with Northwestern. They've got four players hitting above 400. Angela Zadak, Hannah Cady. Uh, you know, just really, really good offensive performances. They scored 31 runs over two games while splitting its first two matchups against LSU and Georgia Tech in Clearwater. So we'll see if they can keep that offensive power rolling here at the Mary Nutter. They had a close one-run loss in walk-off fashion to LSU, too. So this is another team that's probably itching to get a good win. Um, you know, they lost Danielle Williams in the circle, who's just a legendary pitcher. But Ashley Miller transferred in and... 
she seems to be the answer for them handling most of their innings so far. So I'm excited to see how she does at the Mary Nutter. Nebraska, you mentioned it. Um, the biggest storyline heading into this year was Jordy Ball. Probably one of the best pitchers, if not players in the nation, heading home to Nebraska after winning two national championships at Oklahoma. And then she announces she'll be medically redshirting, which is just a pretty devastating blow for Nebraska that had such high hopes this season. Um, they have the pieces offensively. Billy Andrews, Billy Andrews can still really come alive at the plate. Sydney Gray has shown some power for them. Um, so we'll just see how their arms do this weekend. Kaylin Kinney seems to be taking most of the innings, but they had a lot of freshmen throwing last week too. So it's going to be some young arms in the circle. So we'll see how that does against some really experienced lineups. And then Illinois is the other team we've got here. Uh, obviously, they've had a lot of games canceled early in the season, so not much to go off of. They only have one win so far. So it's a little tough to gauge, but they had a lot of transfers coming in, and we'll see how they do in this uh, with this crazy schedule here at the Mary Nutter. Before we let you go, just give us a little insight into Oregon and UCLA. Oregon was a super regional team, I know, last year. UCLA is, of course, a traditional powerhouse. What should people know about each one of them as they prepare to transition here into the Big Ten? Yeah, UCLA, just one of the top programs in the country for as long as I can remember. The biggest thing to know about them this year is Maya Brady. They've had a little bit of a slow start, but the pitching's the main issue, losing Megan Framo last year, but they are just, I really feel like they're going to come into themselves and and um, be a really strong team this year. And coming into the Big Ten, you just know they're going to be always competitive. This is one of the best softball programs in the country. Oregon, too, made it to a Super Regional, like you said, last year. Um, they've got a really balanced offensive lineup, a really balanced rotation in the circle. So I'm excited to see what happens with this team when their bats get hot too. But these are two really good teams and they're always two teams to beat. And it's going to be awesome when they join the Big Ten. It will be already soft, uh, solid softball league getting even better. Uh, some good softball questions, I'd say. I threw you there, Michaela, and you hit them out of the park. Uh, oh, yeah. I couldn't resist. Thanks a lot. Well, Appreciate thank it. I enjoy your time in the desert. Thanks for having me.